coming to you from Jonesboro, Tennessee, the storytelling capital of the world, and broadcasting from the International Storytelling Center. It's Jonesboro's original storytelling radio hour, A Night with the Yarn Exchange. area, diversity is not really the first thing that comes to most people's minds. We've seen enough TV shows and cartoons that show a certain caricature of our people. But we're much more than that. A few years ago, the poet laureate of King Kentucky, Frank X. Walker, came up with a term to describe the African American influence of art and culture in the Appalachian Mountains. He called it Afrolatcha. Tonight's show celebrates our Appalachian poets, artists, and leaders. We've gone out and collected stories about people right here in the Tri-Cities region. We also have a musical guest that cuts through another stereotype of the area. Erin Jackson is here, bringing a mix of rock, blues, and country. We're able to bring all of this here tonight through a generous support from Mountain States Health Alliance, the medical experts you can trust world-class facilities, and the latest technologies close to your home. Tonight's show is also sponsored by the Tennessee Arts Commission. And of course, frozen toast. <laughs> Moms, do mornings come too early for you? Then frozen toast is the answer. From the freezer to the toaster, what could be simpler than frozen toast? Hit it, kids. the region and so many are right here in our own town of Jonesboro. I want to tell you a story about someone I know. I go to Bethel Church. Our ministry is very active. We got a lot of talent in our church. We've done a lot of Black History Month programs where the talent shines. Faye Rutledge is a big part of making it all come together and be so professional. <laughs> She is also an incredible poet, and she performs her poetry at these events, as well as being asked to recite at weddings and anniversary parties. If our town could have a poet laureate, it would be Faye. And we have Faye in our audience tonight, and she's going to share one of her poems with us. Adam's sin. I share a strange kinship through the earth's soil, that from which the first man, Adam, was made. 
Eden's charge, too late, saw evil uncoil. Mankind's path, stone by stone, thus was laid. I look at the ground beneath my bare feet, wondering in whose footsteps I now stand, feeling a faint, pulsating, slow heartbeat, caressing the soft, dark loam in my hand. I stoop and listen to the sparrow's song as the dirt trinkles through my fingertips. The smallest unit of pedon remains strong, though spoken by thought into being from God's lips. I imagine the sweat that fell from brows parched from the harsh rays of the midday sun, aching backs, blistered hands from pushing plows, chopping cotton, blood-stained stacks, day is done. I think about the dark, cramped space of the mind, pickaxe gripped tight while on knees, soot-filled air, blasting sound signals the man down the line, hours of work ahead, he sighs in despair. I remember my grandmother's soft hands tending her gladiolas and marigolds, humming a tune while she sifted silt sands. Peat moss watered, freeing plants from leaf mold. I share a strange kinship through the earth's soil, my atoms that became a living soul. Dust to dust, as Adam's sin did in toil, that I too must swim in death's cold, cold shoal. Frank X. Walker coined the term Appalachian. He also said he wanted to make invisible visible. We have so many leaders in Jonesboro who do their work so quietly that you might not even know about it. Elmer Gillespie has spent a life in service to this community, especially through Bethel Church. For the past 15 years, he has been the director of the Jonesboro Area Ministerial Association Food Pantry. We wanted to know about that story. It was 2002. I've been delivering meals on wheels and helping people like that. When Pam Daniels, who was with the Jonesboro Area Ministerial Association, told me they decided to open a food pantry, start a food pantry. And I asked if I and asked if I'd be interested in working with them. I said yes. It tied in with the work of the Meals on Wheels that I was already doing. But I didn't know the extent to which our community was in need until I worked for the food pantry. Especially our seniors. So many people didn't have enough food to keep them from hunger. The Ministerial Association had done an assessment and discovered this, and all of the churches decide it would be a good thing to start. There are volunteers who help with the food pantry from different area churches, but we knew we needed someone dedicated to serve as the director, especially in the beginning. We have a lot of volunteers now, but when we first started, it was just me. Well, me and Claritha, my wife. The churches started sending volunteers. Now we have a regular rotation. We are open every Thursday to provide food to qualifying people and families. So we have volunteers on Thursdays, but we also have volunteers on Wednesday to go pick up and sort food on Mondays. And we also have them to sort the food in the storage areas. The first Thursday of the month, we have volunteers from the United Methodist Church. The second Thursday is Bethel. The third is from Central Christian. And the fourth, we have volunteers from the Presbyterian Church. And anyone who wants to help volunteer just need to contact any one of those churches. That's the way they work everyone through. We have had a lot of homes through the years. We started at the Presbyterian Church. We moved to the Little Red Brick Building. 
then different places. But last year, the Senior Citizen Center moved, and there was a space that opened up there. We are so grateful to have that space to serve out of now. We have it set up just like a grocery store. I'm someone who is served by that ministry. Mr. Gillespie and the other volunteers, they've really created an environment that makes me feel respected. Now we have carts and baskets. Every person who comes through those doors is treated with dignity. In the new food pantry, we get to shop for and choose what we want. In the old days, when they didn't have as much or as many donations, we kind of took what we were given. But now, we have the dignity of choice. Isn't that what we all really want? It's possible because of our volunteers, because of donations from the churches in our organizations, and because we got good people who work with us <laughs> at Second Harvest at Food City for the dairy products and the Dollar Tree for the other box food items. We've got places like the public library who collect food. And in December, they accept non-perishable food for items in place of library late fees. Nobody should be hungry. Proverbs 11.25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I also know that man cannot live by bread alone. So we pray for them. And when they ask, we pray with them. And I thank God every day for the generosity of others. great story about our own Elmer Gillespie. We'd like to thank Elmer for all the work he does in such quiet ways. What he didn't say, though, is that the new building where the food pantry is located has been named the Elmer Gillespie Building. But there is another building in town named for a family who has also made a real difference in our community. The matriarch of that family is Marion McKinney. Now Marion will tell you about her husband Ernest and her sons and all of their great accomplishments. But we sat down one day and asked her to talk about herself. She told us what it was like for her to raise a family of first. Ernest and I talked about everything. Before we got married, we decided what we wanted, how many children we were going to have, and even what their names were going to be. Then we planned. We were going to get a car, then a house, and then have children. Well, our plans didn't exactly happen in that order. Shortly after we got married, we took in our nephew and raised him as our son. He was with us until he went to Vietnam. When he came home, he became the first African-American police officer in Johnson City, as he grew up as an older brother to our sons, Kevin and Buttons. William, will you help me with my homework? What is this, an essay? No, it's a speech. I have to present it on Monday. A speech? What are you doing, running for alderman like Dad? No, I'm not going to run for alderman. And why is that? because I'm going to start right at the top and be mayor. <laughs> I see. Well, I think you, before you put your mind to it, you can do anything. But, Mr. Mayor, it's past your bedtime. Oh, Mom. When I become mayor, I'm going to make bedtime an hour late. <laughs> Ernest and I looked to our role models as we raised our children. The Birdwells, the McKinneys, and the Taylors. From them, we learned respect for ourselves and for others, and tried to pass that on to our children. We learned to stand by our word. Our children knew that if we said something, they could believe it. The other thing was hard work. 
Ernest never stopped working, never stopped teaching. I remember going out to dinner with him in 2006. The cashier's register wasn't working. Ernest gave her a $20 bill and a penny as the odd change, and she started counting her fingers and couldn't get it. And Ernest said, look here, let me show you something. And he wrote down the amount and taught her how to subtract right there. I said, Ernest, don't bother her like that. And he said, now let me show her so she will know how to do this from now on. It's that quality of caring, I think, that got him elected as the first Ameri African American alderman in Jonesboro. And I think the next generation, with Button and Kevin, who did become mayor of Jonesboro, there is some of that still being passed down. Buttons was in the last graduating class of Jonesboro High School in 1971. And that was the first of our boys to graduate from Middle Tennessee State University. Kevin also graduated from Middle Tennessee State and became the first African-American mayor of Jonesboro. They were able to accomplish great things, and I think it was in part because of the foundations that were laid over generations, from the Birdwells, the McKinneys, and the Taylors, and even beyond that. They were the real first. They were the ones who made it possible. What my mom won't tell you is that she didn't just raise a family of first, she was also the first to do many things. She was a guidance counselor at David Crockett High School. She spent 22 years as a social worker for Washington County. She served on the Board of Elections, the Senior Citizen Advisory Board, and the Public Safety Commission. She has been a role model for us as she has lived a life of service and dedication as a mother, a coach, a counselor, and a humanitarian. She has been a role model for all of us. Thank you, Marion McKinney, for all the leadership you have provided here in Jonesboro. It's no wonder there's a building in Jonesboro named for you and your family. I go to the McKay Center to take art classes. I go to the McKay Center to take drama classes. Same! <laughs> I go to the McKinney Center to paint. I go to the McKinney Center to take pottery. I also go to the McKinney Center for art classes. I've done jewelry making, pottery, and printmaking. It's a wonderful facility. I take painting class lessons at the McKinney Center. I had my wedding anniversary party at the McKinney Center. The auditorium is so beautiful. <clears throat> I've been to a lot of parties there. The McKinney Center has found a new life. It spent many years hidden, almost invisible, off the side of the road at the corner of Main Street and Franklin Avenue. But thanks to the vision of our town leadership, including Adam Dixon, Mara Wolf, Terry Countermine, and Bob Browning, this historic building, with important educational roots in our community, was saved and lovingly restored. It was originally built as the first WPA built building in Washington County to serve as the segregated school for African American students. It has two classrooms, which taught first through eighth grade from 1940 to 1965 when integration came to Jonesboro. After that, it served as a satellite school, sometimes as a kindergarten, and then storage, and finally, it fell out of use. Things were looking bleak for the building until it was determined to save it and preserve the historic roots of African American education in town. Now, instead of a facility that separates the community, it's a place that brings people together of all ages, backgrounds, abilities, 
and cultures through the arts. Not all Beatles were so lucky. I was recently in Asheville with my friend Eddie. We stopped by his elderly parents' house, and they were looking through some old photos and memoirs. I was impressed with the photograph of their high school. They told me about all the memories they shared, and I marveled at how big and how beautiful the school was, and how many, many memories must reside in all those hallways. I thought about the last time I went to visit my old school, and I found where my old locker used to be. Their high school was the Stevens Lee High School, just a magnificent structure, much larger than anything we had here at the time. I said, hey Eddie, before we leave, why can't we go there and take a picture of what it looks like today? And his parents said, you can't. It's gone. Well, I was disappointed that such an important piece of history was gone, and with it, so many memories. It was nothing compared to the loss they must feel. We've got to do all we can to make sure our leaders pay attention to our places of history, especially those places like Stevens Lee and even Lamar in Johnson City. We can't let that history remain invisible. We are fortunate to have the McKinney Center to stand for the history of our past and a beacon of light for the future. And with that, a reminder of the contributions of the people for whom it is named. Since we're still celebrating people in Jonesboro, I have someone I want to talk about, Alfred Greenlee. He knew about all the people in Jonesboro almost as much as he knew where every water pipe was laid underground throughout town. Alfred was the go-to neighbor under any circumstance. If you needed help with anything, he knew how to help, or else he could connect you with someone who could help you. He was called on day and night by his neighbors for his knowledge and expertise and his singing. I don't think he worked a single job without singing whatever song was in his heart. And even more mysteriously, the song he would sing while he was over at your house, say, fixing the plumbing, was exactly the song you needed to hear to sort of fix your soul. Well, I remember one time he'd come over to our house when we had trouble with the commode. No matter what I did, I couldn't move it, couldn't change it, so of course, I called Alfred. At the same time, I'd been struggling with some issues at work, where I was feeling like maybe I wasn't being treated fairly enough, or given enough credit. So Alfred is over, and suddenly he starts singing in his booming voice, I think it was a hymn, I don't know, but I remember the words. Jesus wants me for his sunshine. Jesus wants me for his sunshine. He's singing this song while he's lifting up this big, heavy commode that I couldn't budge. I hear the words he sings, and it hits my heart. I looked at my husband, and I saw tears in his eyes. I knew something had shifted, and I'm not talking about the commode. <laughs> I'd been struggling, I guess, for recognition. But really, the work I was doing should be done with a feeling of service. Jesus wants me for his sunshine. My job on this earth is to be of service to others like Alfred. Not expecting great praise, not expecting anything in return, but simply to serve. I tried to find the words to thank him when he left, and he said what he always said. Hmm. Oh, I didn't do nothing. But he did. He always did, in small ways, with a big impact. He did what that song asks. He brought sunshine wherever he went. He sure did. <laughs> he did, and he always did it with a song in his heart. Music is a thread that runs historically through this region. Up next, we've got our good friend, Angie Fellers-Mason, from the Heritage Alliance. Tonight, she's going to take us back in time to tell us another story of an African-American artist with roots right here in Jonesboro in a segment 
we all like to call Ask the Historian. Welcome, Ann. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Music unites us all. It brings change. Music brings redemption. It's life. Music is an introduction. Jonesboro native Miss Fanny Snow shared music around the world when she sang with the Fisk Jubilee Singers out of Nashville, Tennessee. When I first learned of Miss Fanny Snow, it wasn't as a singer. I first met her as a teacher. Through Adam Dixon, I met Mrs. Ruth Gillespie, her son Mr. Eugene Gillespie, and his wife Georgia. Mrs. Gillespie talked of her great aunt Fanny Snow, and her history began to unfold, just like a good song. One thing led to another, a note here, a chord there, and before I knew it, there was a song. A song about a woman who valued education and fought for it all her life. Now, Miss Finney Snow attended school here in Jonesboro at the Warner Institute at the top of East Main Street. Now, after graduating from the Warner, she attended Fisk University in Nashville. Founded in 1866, shortly after the end of the Civil War, Fisk University is a historically black university and is the oldest institution of higher learning in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1871, the school was in dire financial straits, and they sent their singing group, the Fisk Jubilee Singers, out to try and help raise money to save the school. They were met with consternation and hatred at first, but they persevered, and soon they were filling concert halls worldwide. Their efforts saved the university, and today the Fisk Jubilee Singers continue to raise their voices. Miss Fanny Snow raised her voice too, and in addition of the Fisk Herald, it was noted that Miss Fanny Snow travels as a singer for the university. Success to you, Fanny. Now, following her graduation from Fisk University in 1893, Fanny Snow became a teacher, but not of music, of English, a subject she regarded as the cornerstone of education. She spent her days in Evansville, Indiana, where she taught school for 46 years. During those 46 years, she never missed a day. The total amount of school she missed was two hours. <laughs> Mrs. Gillespie has fond memories of her great aunt coming to visit during the summer, but only during the summer because she didn't want to miss any school. The Fisk Herald kept up with Fanny Snow, and a former teacher remembered her saying, There was Fanny Snow, for many years a student, now a respected teacher in the Evansville Public School. She was a stammerer who always came out a line behind in the reading class. Is it possible that music, that singing, helped Fanny Snow find her voice and her resolve? She's not here to ask, so we'll never know for sure. But we do know music touches and changes lives. Miss Fanny Snow died in 1959 at the age of 89. She is remembered by her family, and her legacy of teaching lives on through Mrs. Gillespie's granddaughter, who is an assistant principal in Knoxville. And now her memory lives on through you, too. The memory of a woman who valued education, who broke barriers, who used music and the written word to change the fates of others. Good history is like a good song. You always walk away with more. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to A Night with the Jonesboro Yarn Exchange on WETS 89.5 FM out of Johnson City, Tennessee. Jackson Band is here with us tonight. Let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here. And when I say that, I really mean it. These past couple of days, I've been holed up in the airport at the Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida airport. <laughs> A great place to spend a couple of nights, if I do say so. So, we finally got all of that stuff uh, ironed out, but I would recommend not flying Allegiant Airlines. 
It's a bad experience, but I'm glad to be out in the land of the living where I can now get a, a cup of coffee for under nine dollars. <laughs> anyway, folks, it's great to be here. Again, my name's Aaron Jackson. I'm originally from Texas. I came up here about 12 years ago to play in the ETSU Bluegrass Band. And uh, I've done that, and I've played in a lot of bands since then, a lot of different styles of music. I've played country, blues, rock and roll, even some pop and R&B. So what I'm going to play for y'all tonight, there are a couple of uh, a couple of original songs here that I normally play with the big, loud, five-piece rock band, but uh, I'm really glad to be able to kind of do a little more uh, acoustic, kind of an intimate thing here for you. So this first one is one I've had for a while. Uh, it's called I'll Be Gone For A While. Hope y'all enjoy this. Because 